welcome to a job 50, five, zero. We've done 50 episodes of the Adam Josh Oral Brog. Hard to believe, but here we are. And I'm in this for the long run, ladies and gentlemen. You're not going to see me unless uh, something crazy happens. Quitting a job anytime soon. On the Lunchtime with Adam show, I went 100 lunches. I think on the 75, 75th episode, I realized, wow, this is sort of getting boring and uh, tedious. I, I used to spend hours editing to get it down to like a 10 or 12 minute lunch show for my friends and whoever would watch. So hours of your day spent editing is sort of tedious. Uh, other shows I did haven't really went as long as Lunchtime with Adam show, but this one, as you, if you've been watching, you realize I don't edit it, so I'm in the office right now, and if somebody comes in and starts talking to me, I have a choice. Either I press stop and start again, which I've done a few times, or I just let it ride. People come in and talk to me, and that's how it is. I hope that people who are watching can appreciate that, that I'm not editing this. Because I know what it's like to edit things and spend a lot of time doing it, and uh, I'm not doing that right now. Also, uh, I drink and eat, because I'm not editing it out. What you see is what you get. Where are we? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm listening to, uh, we're listening to Rob, Rob Zombie, Thunder Kiss 65. Good song. And <clears throat> I had it in my mind to do an A job about death during the weekend. And, uh, and then I sort of reconsidered and I thought, you know, that's sort of a death is sort of a, a touchy subject that I might want to avoid. Oh, by the way, I'm wearing my 3D glasses. You know, whoa, 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 you're in 3D. Whoa, you're in a 3D. These are my 3D glasses. So, I was going to reconsider and then I saw Rob uh, an interview with Rob Zombie. And you can go on YouTube and type this in. Uh, Rob Zombie on death. Somebody interviews him and you'd think somebody with the last name Zombie would believe in sort of life after death or zombies or something. And in the interview he goes, you know, I don't believe, I, th I think this is it. You die and, and this is it. Rob Zombie interview life after death. Let's try that. Now how is it that I watched this interview already? Haha. -ha. Sorry, you'd have to YouTube Rob Zombie, What Happens When You Die. So he's on this show, Adler Cast, and the guy just comes out and says, What happened to you? What's he done? I never even in the studio at the same time. They're so straight laced and so uptight and so dull. And like, you know, I'm used to being around people that are f***ing nuts. He's a washed up alcoholic Mexican wrestler. Alexis is on back. Alice Cooper. Rob Zombie. Added a little. I Let's skip right to this. So what's the guy? Another. And the All right, here we go. Pan the camera. What do you think happens after you die? Nothing. Nothing? You rock. And some fertilizer. Really? You know, what do you think happens? I don't know. I, I love the concept of heaven. We go to heaven where, where what? Every Neanderthal man and Civil War soldier. Okay, so then he's you know making points, his points about heaven, saying that if you go to you know if we go to heaven, then every cat and every blah blah blah, and he's gonna have a whole bunch of pets in heaven if he goes to heaven. So he believes that he mocks it and thinks that you know when you die, that's it. And I guess sort of like we're all in the context of me sort of criticizing that we're all sort of ants trying to describe a human. I think. I think those guys are gods because they come down and they're huge and or like a flea describing an elephant you know so when we talk about death we kind of sort of share our mutual experiences where this happened to me and 
uh, near-death experiences are sort of popular to share and all that. And uh, I don't claim to be uh, an authority on, on uh, any of that, but I have had my share of experiences, and I think that my opinion on the matter of death is a valid one. I went and bought some toffee, so excuse me while I unwrap my Wonka toffee. As I was saying earlier, that would be edited out if I was editing. All right, so let's start with um, an Adam Josh dot com reference from uh, September 17th, 2009 when I started uh, getting into Nassim Haramin's work. You can uh, Google him. He's uh, sort of like an advanced new sort of thinking physicist who uh, won a peer-reviewed award for the his work with the Schwarzschild proton or the he It's a little bit complicated and my memory isn't too fresh right now on exactly uh, everything that he's done. But I think his website is theresonanceproject.org. The Schwarzschild paper, the Schwarzschild proton. He won the best paper award in the field of physics, quantum mechanics, relativity, field theory, field theory and gravitation. I'm quoting him now. Our subject is death. We haven't ever, ever experienced the death of anything. We haven't observed that. We, ha we really haven't. All we observed is things changing state. For instance, I'm not talking esoterically here. For instance, people have all sorts of debates about if life continues after death or eternal whatever. You don't need to be esoteric. Just take what you got and extrapolate from it. You have a few billion atoms. You're welcome. <laughs> There's a lot of cells. There's a hundred trillion cells in the human body. And they're all organized in an organized manner. And all of a sudden, they unorganized. However, all these atoms are still spinning. You haven't lost one. They're still out there. They're still spinning. In fact, you might be made out of the atoms of your neighbor. Your neighbor might be made out of your atoms. And so there is no evidence that things actually stop because there is space-time torque going towards singularity in each point. Then there's angular momentum at all levels, and things continue spinning no matter what. What I'm saying is the friction that's out there is overcome by the space-time torque, and that makes it appear as a frictionless environment. We don't see death. We just see things changing levels of organization, changing scale. And when we see a star exploding, they call it the death of a star. But when they focus on that same area afterward, what do they see? They see a pulsar. Oh, that's nice. They just changed the name from star to pulsar. So the star is dead, but the pulsar is born. Let me give you an example. If you were a camera inside a woman's womb, and this woman, woman was pregnant, you would see life developing in that womb. And after nine months, you would probably have a pretty good relationship with this life inside the woman's womb. And all of a sudden, there's this big earthquake in your world, the water disappears, and there's an opening in that womb, like a little black hole, in the end of this hip joint. And this being that you had a relationship with, the pierce of that black hole. You would experience death. You would think that this being is dead or gone. The person on the other side of the hole experiences life, crossing the event horizon. So what I'm saying is that our mathematics and our views have not shown us that actually pulsars and supernovas explosions are the result of when space-time torque is torqued into a certain radius and it generates material inside. So that the Big Bang is only one of several, one of those events rather, that generated the atoms of our universe. The atoms are actually being manufactured at the singularity of black holes and that's the exchange of those atoms coming out of those vortexes as the space-time torque influences those black holes. And when those particles get out of there, they are stuck in the gravitational field of that black hole and they accrete on the surface of that event horizon as well as other atoms that are created by the black hole as it travels through space. 
And when it accretes too much, the material becomes unbalanced. There's too much radiation from the contractive torque force at the center of the system. The system slows down too much and the instability generates an explosion. It blows up. What it does, it releases a layer of material so that it can regain stability. And so that's what we see. And then it regains stability and when it does, the radius is much shorter. The ballerina has brought her arms in as the thing spins way fast like a pulsar and then it's fast enough that we call it a black hole and we say, look, the star made a black hole. And what I'm saying is no, the black hole was always there. What we observe now is the dynamics of that black hole much closer to the event horizon so we see the X-ray emissions that we wouldn't have observed before. Now we start to see the universe as cycles in space instead of start, stop, start, stop you start to see that maybe, just maybe, that's how our universe was created. An enormous black hole that became unstable and blew up in a certain amount of its argosphere, its plasma that generated all life, all the rest of the stuff we see today, and that those cycles are mo most likely going forever and ever, which is what we observe from the weather patterns on Earth to the dynamics of our solar system. That's one article I wanted to read. Some heavy stuff. Here's something that I wrote a little while later, again on the uh, AdamJosh.com, titled, uh, A Little Death Never Killed No One. And if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll put the links on the sidebar. I'm oh, sorry. I don't know which side I'm facing. This, under, in the description, rather. If you're on my website, then I'll put it down there as well. <clears throat> this is uh, May 5th, 2010. I wrote this, so this A job is actually covering about a three year span of me covering and talking about the same subject. What is death? Dear humanity, alright, so this is what happens when you go to bed really early. You wake up at strange times. It's 1.45 a.m. and I'm wide awake. After my trek to the cemetery last night, I had quite a neat old revelations about life that I wanted to share, but I thought I'd sleep on them to sort them out, and here we are. Let's put our thinking caps on. Speaking of which, is what? <laughs> Is one of your nostrils bigger than the other? That actually may be why you've always been a little more artistic or structured than normal. Say your right nostril is bigger than your left, you may be more artistic of a person seeing as your right brain is having more oxygen delivered to it on a daily basis than your left brain. Just a thought, side issue. All right, thinking caps on, great, let's tackle death. <laughs> death, what is death? How do you define death? As humans, we have adopted a flawed view of what death is. Open your mind for a second and consider the universe with me. I have just a thing to get you out of your mind. And then I show uh, this video of the known universe. For us, mostly stuck on our rocky vision. The view of the universe begins with Earth. This is Earth. Silicon and oxygen based with a metallic core. The surface is mostly water. It teems. Its surface temperature is nearly 10 thousand. The sun is part of the solar system. Form. You can sort of watch that on your own, I suppose, later. Um, the YouTube title is Size of the Universe. So, then I skip to this. Are you considering the universe now? Phew, I am. Put, but putting aside our humanity for a second. Wow, there really is quite a lot of other stuff out there, but what is that stuff? Well, even a lifeless rock is made of matter, which is made of atoms, of particles, of molecules, made of energy. So it's fair to say that when we consider the universe, we are considering a universe full of life and energy. Energy is life. Maybe not the life that we are used to hearing about, but life nonetheless. Of course, complex creatures with consciousness is an entirely different level of life, but just like water and air are life and energy, so too is the universe full of life and energy in its boundaries. And then I show a video of a time-lapse seed growing, and I ask the question, what is seed? Is seed a tree? Is seed the finished product? How would you, you define the finished product? When we use a tree to burn for fuel, or to power a steam engine locomotive on, or a campfire, we are harnessing the power of that tree or the power of the sun. Actually, it's stored in the tree in a sense. The, that tree had energy stored in it, but does the seed? When you hold a maple tree seed in your hand, are you holding a tree and all the subsequent trees that will come as a result of this one seed? Or are you just holding a dead seed? How is seed dead if it brings forth a potentially, a potentially endless amount of energy? Also, we use trees for paper, so when you're holding that seed in your hand, how many potential books are you holding? Could the tiny seed in your hand wind up being your grandkids' favorite bestseller? Also, 
fruit carry seed. Bananas, kiwis, apples, cherries, mangoes, blueberries, grapes, etc. are all seed bearing fruit. So technically speaking, one could produce a plant which yields thousands of pieces of fruit with millions of seeds, which could plant a million of plants, which could yield billions of pieces of fruit with trillions of seeds in it, etc., etc. Why is life like this? Do you see my point? We are utterly surrounded and enveloped in life and energy. It's all around us, it is in us, and it is us. Putting aside the religious twists, humans are like fruit in a sense as well. Your ancestors planted seed in each other, waited nine months, and had your grandparents, who also planted seed inside each other and waited nine months and had your parents, who planted seed inside each other and waited nine months and then, excuse me, then there's you. So how much life or energy was in your great-grandparents' seed? I bet if you could have showed him, you may have reconsidered the six-pack and backseat dinner date. So it seems that we are like a tree and fruit seed in this context. When you divide life, you get more life, like a hologram of divided infinities. Infinity contained in boundaries, the quantum mechanics of the holographic reality. In this manner, our species doesn't die, just as the same as how seed isn't dead, and similar to how fruit seed, which is planted, can grow into an infinite amount more fruit. In short, life goes on. That's what it does. It lives. If life was personified, we could say that life has lived, and, it, and has lived for a pretty long time. So where do we get this concept of death as we commonly know it then? Beats me. I've never really considered death an end, but that's for the religious reasons. Taken in this broader context that we have discussed here, wouldn't it make more sense to just lose the whole word altogether? I'm thinking we could, we could go with change. The seed isn't dead, it's changing. The caterpillar isn't dead in that cocoon, it's changing. The animal on the side of the road isn't dead, it's changing into another form of matter, a plant earth. We don't die, we change from one expression of ourselves to the next. There is no death. There is only changing, life changing forms. If we are alive, then we live. Life lives. So we must go on because we are alive. Matter is in a constant state of change. I mean, aside from the constant movement of the earth and our solar system, think of the mirror in your bathroom. It was once sand, maybe on a beach somewhere. It was melted and formed and shipped wherever to ultimately be hung on your wall. But that isn't where it'll stay forever. No, it's still in a state of change. One day it may very, may, may very well be broken thrown out and returned to sand over time, or it can be recycled into another form of glass. Because we are perceiving time from our vantage point of now, we have a hard time imagining this fourth dimension of future time. If we could, though, we'd see everything with trails around it, trails leading the objects from where they were to where they're heading, from where they have been. It would be one big acid trip. Yes, please. Long story short, death doesn't exist for us. Maybe death exists for some other creatures who enjoy tricking us into thinking death is for us when really it isn't, but death, as commonly defined, is an improper semantic pigeonhole and, shouldn't be, it sh and should be replaced by something a little more modern, like change. We are surrounded by life and energy in, in a universe full of life and energy. Our very souls are a form of energy. Our synapses in our brains are firing with energy. Life is in our blood. The first law of thermodynamics states that matter cannot be created or destroyed, that it merely changes form. That's us. Here's to shedding outdated and silly conceptual pigeonholes. Here's to life, it's what we are and what we will always be, unless the creator of that life decides otherwise. So go give someone a hug. <clears throat> so, you know, in that interview, Rob Zombie says, you know, when you go in the, when you die, it's it. You go on the ground, you become worm food. And sort of looking at our body as a um, a lifeless bacteria and there is truth to that obviously that the gut flora in your gut and the bacteria and different cells that you're made of are cells that make up a whole that will slowly unorganize and uh, the life force in your blood that's holding all the bacteria at bay from eating itself once the life force or whatever is 
keeping you alive leaves, you decompose. You know, I guess we're slowly decomposing now, in one sense, uh, with age. But then, I think that's pretty clearly different than the rapid decomposition that you, that happens to somebody when they die. <laughs> Lastly, let's uh, look at uh, December twenty third, two thousand and nine. Uh, I wrote a little death never killed no one on AdamJosh.com as well. I've been to my share of funerals. I've been close to death loved and lost and all that. I've seen age take people, I've seen sickness take people, I've seen accidents take people, and I've seen people take people. Maybe I'm a little weird, but when, it, but when someone I care about dies, it really affects me. Even people who I merely know when they die, it bothers me. Statistically speaking, roughly two people on Earth die every second. Thankfully, around four people are born every second, so as you can imagine, the world population is growing, not shrinking. And no, this isn't an entry where I'm going to prove all my facts. Look it up if you don't believe me. I am 100% certain that I am better equipped to handle death than most people. At the same time, the knowledge of sorrow and confusion that most people go through following a loved one's death puts me in a strange place. I can sense what other people are feeling, and most of the time I'm not the greatest comforter. Maybe because, maybe this isn't the best an analogy, but the first thing I thought of was a child all teary-eyed and sad over the discovery of a mall Santa's accidental death and me trying to comfort the child by saying, don't worry, Santa was never real anyway. When you talk to people about death, you're talking to all their past experiences, all their preconceived notions of the subject, and worst of all, you're talking to their religious indoctrination. For me, all that is enough to simply be the quiet one at a funeral, and I'd rather not get into advanced quantum physics, like we talked about earlier, with grieving people. All of that to say, death is a serious business, and maybe not everyone has had the chance, as I have, to face death head on, grab it by the short and curlies, and ask, is that all you've got? When you're one of the few humans on earth who have no few fear of death, you may find yourself forgetting that most people haven't crossed that hurdle, nor will they ever. Personally speaking, I feel there are much worse things than death. Have you seen the unspeakable, an unspeakable humanities this world has to offer? How about those brave souls who are willing to blow the lid off their former government employer, employers only to find out that their loved ones have been threatened to the point that no one feels safe in their own home? Living under the possibility Living under the fear of the possibility that your children could be harmed instead of you. Now that's worse than, worse than death in my opinion. I suppose all that bottlenecks me to my final point. That when you have no fear of death, what remains of death is the effect that it leaves with those who are left behind. Which to me is the real sting of death. There was a time that I accepted my fate and I did my best to seal the deal early. With all that fog of time lifted, I was left with the in incurable hurt that I caused to those who loved me. If I would have known the damage my demise would do to people beforehand, I certainly would have found reason to pull through whatever adolescent emotional problems I was having at the time. So here's the 12 years since then and to all the ones who are still able to, able to love in these spectacularly messed up times. And that concludes the, uh, the blogs that I'll be referencing off the website. But to put it, if I haven't already said it in, in enough ways already, um, I don't think that our our term death is a proper term of what happens. It's not what we, when we say that a seed dies or like something dies, it's 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 about as correct as saying when the uh, when the worm goes into the cocoon, it dies there. Uh, but that's not correct because what's happening in that cocoon is that there's a change going on, a molecular, a molecular, molecular and biological change that uh, results in the emergence of a butterfly. And so for me personally, you know, I've had three near-death experiences. One, where I, when I was younger, I, I took a whole bunch of pills and tried to kill myself and uh, woke up in, uh, in a hospital and I uh, had to be evaluated for a while and I've spent a lifetime in counseling for that and other things so I, I, uh, I don't need anybody's sympathy or uh, I'm not looking for anybody's sympathy and I'm not looking for anybody's advice or whatever on how to deal with stuff like that. I've had a lifetime of it. But um, that was one experience. Another was when uh, uh, two years ago uh, or a year and a half ago rather when um, when I fell down Tripped on my, I tripped on some uh, sandals I had, and I cut my hand open here. And who knew that you had an artery in your thumb? I have a little scar right there, but I, you have an artery right there, and I was bleeding out. 
doctor said if I hadn't uh, arrived, I would have bled out in about uh, 20 more minutes. And that wouldn't have been good. And the other one was, the other near-death experience I had uh, was uh, when I was in the hospital because my kidneys failed. And sorry, one, one thing sort of leads to another, right? My kidneys failed because I took uh, too much Advil because I had a toothache. So one thing that led to another and my kidneys failed and apparently that's how uh, elderly people, when they go, it's like one organ fails, the one organ supports the other one, and you basically uh, die in your sleep of organ failure one after the other. This is what the doctor told me, that I would have died in my sleep if I had, hadn't uh, got to the hospital that night. And the reason I went to the hospital was because I couldn't pee because my kidneys weren't working. So it, for three days I had a buildup of two liters of urine. And uh, when they put the catheter in me, being one of the youngest persons that they, the doctor had ever seen me in a catheter there, I, uh, I literally had two liters of uh, urine in my bladder, which was pretty wild. So we can laugh about it now. And uh, I think my previous two de near-death experiences have sort of uh, knocked me, a knock, I don't know, not, what I was gonna say, I was gonna try to, I'm trying to say, my previous two death experiences sort of uh, lubed me up a bit, primed me, and I was, I'm not, I'm, I wasn't afraid of death then, I wasn't afraid of death the first or second time, but, anyway, so, there's worse things than dying, and, uh, you know, maybe people like Rob Zombie aren't afraid of death, so I shouldn't pigeonhole people that, that uh, say that death is an end, with saying everybody's afraid of death, but fear of death is a pretty big, uh, is a pretty common thing. People are afraid of dying. People want to live forever in this body. Uh, some people are just petrified of, of dying. I'm petrified of the unknown. My personal take on death I think that if you track the course of our life, you know, starting off really small as a sperm or an egg and being mixed together and growing from this really small point from the head down, I can think I can you can pretty clearly see that we've been growing along the line of knowledge and information and progression along the course of our lives. And uh, whatever energy was inside in, inside of us that's been propelling us through our life, I think that that doesn't cease uh, when this body decides to give out. I think the energy that's inside of us, like the first law of thermodynamics says, can't be created or destroyed but goes into different forms. So you can look at it and say, yeah, you go into the ground and your worm food and this and that. That's sort of one way of looking at it. But I don't think we'll have any less consciousness than we have now. I think it's more likely that these bodies are sort of limiting our, our consciousness and limiting our um, limiting our vision and awareness. You know, we take in audio through our ears and take in sight from our eyes and taste and all that, it all sort of collaborates in the brain and gives us an impression uh, in our brain of what's out there when really all it is is electrical signals interpreted by our brain. I don't think that those limitations that we have in the narrow band of, of uh, light that we see when there's so much more out there, I don't think that that is all that there is. I think that when we are able to finally escape these bodies that we have increased awareness and ideas of heaven and hell or heaven and earth after hereafter are, are completely other topics completely other topics than death to say that because we don't cease automatically means that it's heaven or hell is ridiculous there's those are those are all different subjects so, just because I believe that we don't cease when we die, that doesn't automatically believe that I think we're all going to be eating filthy cream cheese on clouds. 
playing harps, or that the the Hitlers and and bad people, you know, are going to be uh, burning in a eternal lake of fire. That's not those. Just because I believe in life after death doesn't automatically believe that I have to have that dichotomy of light, uh, heaven or hell. And I think those are, uh, you know, subjects that have been heavenly, he heavily uh, propagandized and have their own sort of cultish beliefs on both sides. So, for me personally, I've experienced when people looking at me at the physical body look like, wow, you look like hell, you look like you're about to die. And that's what people are seeing of the physical body. But what I was perceiving at that same time was unlimited power about to, you know, I felt like I was about to escape from this body and I felt like greater awareness. I was physically seeing like angels all around me. And I've had those feelings where it, you feel like it's only going to get better. And even if we did cease, which I don't believe at all, I think that for a lot of people who are maybe suffering, that would even be better. But my overall positive outlook on life is that things are going to get better one way or the other. Whether whether or not these bodies finally die and we get to have this greater awareness and more awareness and more consciousness and less limitation. Either way you slice it, things are going to get better. So that's my overall positive outlook on, on life and death is that things... In the end, the good guys win. In the end, things will get better. And it can only be bad for so long. And it seems sometimes like we're stuck in this body vehicle forever. But, you know, when you wake up from a dream and you're trying to remember it, that might be what it will be like when our consciousness escapes these bodies. And getting into the idea, getting into the, the, the conversation of Okay, so where are these bodies from? Where is our consciousness from? Did somebody create our consciousness? What about angels and devils? Blah, 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 blah. Those are all other subjects that I'm not afraid to tackle, but the re a, lot of the a lot of the reason that people don't want to talk about death is because they realize that all this luggage sort of comes with this topic. The luggage of what about life after death? What about heaven and hell? What about angels, demons, and gods, and creators? Blah, 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 blah. And at the end of the day, in our instant culture, and give me a Big Mac because I'm on my way, I gotta go, gotta go party, gotta go do some things. In our culture like that, where we're always so busy, and I want like a sound bite, give me like a 20 second sound bite of what, how you really feel about creationism in 20 seconds. I mean, we don't, in that world we live in, it's hard to sit down and, and, and have these conversations and try to discuss all these things with people who are of the fast, give me, give me, give me, I just wanna go, go, go type people. So when we're when we're younger, that's sort of how we are. We sort of resent the older people for sitting, for wanting to sit us down and say, "Okay, you want to talk about this? Let's talk about it." In 1975, and that's sort of the way things are sometimes. That, and the best part is, we all get to experience it ourselves. So, 10 out of 10 people die statistically. So you'll you'll get to see all this for yourself. Our ideas and concepts of time of size are all limited to our interpretation through the human body. So some people say like how big do you think will be? What will life, what will time feel like after after we get out of the bodies? Well what does time feel like in a dream? What does time feel like when you're already free of these bodily constraints and linear time? So trying to describe size, concepts of size and time when when your consciousness or what you are, what makes you you, leaves your body, is about as futile as trying to describe uh, time concepts in a dream or perceptions of time. So I don't really get into those topics. I think that trying to mechanically shape ideas of life after death into our human preconceived packaged ideas of time and size is sort of futile because the idea is you're not in this body anymore. So that's uh, about it for what is death. Thanks for watching the uh, Adam Josh Oral Brog number 50. And uh, 
summing up, I don't have any fear of death. I haven't since I was 16. It might be because, you know, when I tried to off myself and I didn't, for a while I was sort of depressed afterwards, but then I sort of got, sort of started feeling like I was um, invincible. And uh, now, through a series of uh, accidents and bodily injuries, I realize that this physical body isn't invincible and it's better to keep it healthy as long as you can. Whatever's on the inside may be impeded through uh, chemicals or whatever if somebody wanted to go that uh, route with me, like poisoning or whatever, but uh, whatever this, this is that's inside of me, the thing that's controlling my mouth and my hands and controlling this and forcing me to have this conversation with you, uh, that is energy, this phantom power energy that uh, I believe is uh, a lot more than meets the eye that uh, if I chop off my hand or somebody does, I think I'm, I'm, I know that I'm still me. Uh, I'm still that person. I don't define myself by all the things that I've done in my life, uh, my accomplishments or my lack of accomplishments. Uh, I think it's great that I can play guitar and play drums and, and sing moderately, but I don't define myself by those things. I don't have a, a low self-esteem or a high self-esteem. I don't have any esteem. You know, I think all this is going to seem so petty, and uh, some parts of it will seem a lot more insignificant than they do now when you've crossed over to the other side. And uh, sometimes I envy people that are on the other side. And the thing that keeps me here in this body now is a few things. One, experiencing the things that I want to experience. Two, the knowledge that 100 years or 90 years may all sort of flash together in like a, a dream when we wake up out of this body. Aside from the fact that I've realized that I'm, I guess I'm not really good at killing myself. Since I wasn't able to do it, <coughs> despite my attempts, I'm here to live life. So, fear of death is a crippling fear, a crippling thing that, that has a lot of people in its grip. And I'm not one of them. So, there's lots of worse things than death though, which is, you know, how people get you. They don't threaten you or whatever. They threaten your family or your friends. So, personally speaking, I'm not afraid of, uh, of dying or death. And uh, sometimes I actually look forward to it. So that's what one of the reasons that I'm a little bit different probably than some people that you know and I'm not interested in a lot of the things that other people are and Thanks for watching the Adam Josh Oral Broad. I will finish my coffee now. Bye.